Well, Mark chapter 4 has some very commonly held, understood, uh, familiar parables and teachings and experiences of the life of Jesus for us today. So some fun parables he's going to get into, as well as they're going to go do some sailing and uh, some of the miracles that he's performed on the water. Verse 1, And he began again to teach by the seaside. And there was gathered unto him a great multitude, so that he entered into a ship and sat in the sea, and the whole multitude was by the sea on the land. So remember, he's on the ship, the people on the land, so they can hear him better. The acoustics of the Sea of Galilee was pretty good. And he, verse 2, he taught them many things by parables and said unto them in his doctrine, Hearken, behold, there went out a sower to sow. And it came to pass that as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. And some fell on stony ground, where it had not much earth. And immediately it sprang up, because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and yielded no fruit. And other fell on good ground, and did yield fruit that sprang up and increased, and brought forth some thirty, some sixty, and some an hundred. And he said unto them, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Now, just so you know, again, if you've been following our, our uh, New Testament videos, watch the book of Matthew, you realize that whenever you hear that phrase, even in the Old Testament, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear, there's hidden messages. That's the code word for there's hidden messages here. So there's more to this parable than just, hey, some guy went out and threw seed in four different places and got four different responses. Actually, he got more than four different responses. So that was, uh, <clears throat> there's more to it, basically. Now, verse 10, and when he was alone, they that were about him with the 12 asked of him the parable. Now, Joseph Smith's translation changes verse 10 a little bit. They say, and when he was alone with the 12 and they that believed in him, that they that were asked him of the parable. So even though verse 10 sounds like he was alone, but yet not alone, Joseph Smith's translation clarifies that a little bit more, that he was alone with the 12, basically. Uh, and he said unto them, unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables. If you remember in the Matthew, when we went over those videos, that uh, they asked Christ, why do you teach in these parables? Why do you use these, these enigmatic stories? So they were asking Christ, and then he answered him and answered them and talked with them. We don't get that part of the conversation here in, Ma in Mark. Uh, so verse 12, he goes on and says that seeing they may see, and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest at any time they should be converted, and their sins should be forgiven them. Uh, now, we talked about this again in, in uh, Matthew a little bit. That almost sounds like Christ is like, well, I don't want them to learn, because I don't want them to be converted. That seems contradictory to what Christ did. So we have to be careful with that one because it's like, well, maybe maybe verse 12 is not quite accurate. Maybe it's saying more of there's hidden meaning here, but they're not ready to hear that meaning. He doesn't want them to not be converted because that's the whole point of teaching is to encourage people to follow him and be involved with him. But it's, it's uh, or at least have that opportunity to make the choice to follow or not. Uh, but uh, it's there's more to it. And they're not, like he said in Matthew, the apostles are there to understand the deeper meanings. But it's not for the people to understand the deeper meanings. And so that's probably more of a more accurate way to say it than what we have here in verse 12. Uh, verse 13, And he said unto them, Know ye not this parable? And how then will ye know all parables? So he's going to explain what's going on here. So verse 14, The sower soweth the word. So the sower is like a, an apostle or a missionary teaching the gospel. The word, the seeds are the gospel. Verse 15, these are they by the wayside where the word is sown. But when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. 
So the ones that were on the wayside, Satan basically has power over them. And he convinces them to not do anything with the word. Okay. Uh, if you are, so let's, well, let's go through these. Verse 16, and these are they likewise, which are sown on the stony ground, who when they have heard the word immediately receive it with gladness and have no root in themselves and so endure but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution ariseth for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. So this is a group. So if you think of the, the stony ground, okay, if you have stony ground, usually there's a, a thin layer of dirt on top of it, like dust and things that have collected on top of the, the stony ground. So when the seeds are there, they grow up quickly because they're close to the surface, but they can't get deep roots because of the rocks. So these would be people who act religious, but aren't truly religious. They have a shallow testimony. They're not going deep into themselves of being very purposeful and vulnerable with the gospel. They are acting outward as if they are a part of the gospel, but they don't really internalize it themselves. So they, they like it, but they don't really like it that much to change their behaviors. Because again, it says when they're at, when the afflictions and persecutions, you know, when times get hard, they're like, I'm out. This isn't worth it. I'm not changing my lifestyle to fit this basically is what it's saying. Uh, verse 18. And these are they, which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lusts of other things entering in choke the word and it becometh unfruitful. So these are people that this is different than the stony ground. So they got on decent soil, but there was lots of thorny bushes and other weeds around. And so they struggled for resources. They struggled to the, the seed struggled to grow because this is the whole idea of, of serving two masters. Do I love the world? Do I love doing what the world wants or do I want to do what God wants? And they struggle with that back and forth, and they end up usually doing what the world wants. So they're prioritizing the world over God, basically. Uh, so that's the problem. They're following what Hollywood says is great, but they're not following what God says is great. So they, they spend more time going after the riches and the wealth and, and things rather than doing what God wants. Uh, verse 20, and these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word and receive it and bring forth fruit, some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some hundred. So these are the ones you get good ground, they get fertile soil, the roots grow deep, this, it grows up, and you get a yield. So there's fruit that you get off of this. These are people who who accept the gospel, they bring it into their heart, they are... Uh, from a Protestant standpoint or evangelical standpoint, these are the ones that would say they're born again. They have that spirit of Christ with them. They feel the difference. They've repented. They've been sincere with their testimony, with con working with God. They are in that position of, they're, you know, they're baptized. They're, they're fulfilling the ordinances and the commandments and things. They want to teach the gospel. They want to help other people feel that good feeling themselves as well. And uh, these are the people who are ready. And it's interesting that it talks about there's different types of yields that these people give. So from an LDS standpoint, there's another way that we could be looking at this perspective. Uh, is we can, we can see in here that uh, the group of people going back into verse 15, where Satan controls them and keeps them away from the gospel, out of darkness, we could see those who are on the stony ground, they receive the word, but when times get rough, they back, they bail out of it as terrestrial kingdom. Uh, we can see those who, who love the riches and the cares of the world more than God, telestial kingdom. And we can see those who are sown on good ground as celestial kingdom and many mansions within the celestial kingdom with a different yield. Each have a yield. So that's where, if we're thinking about this idea, so each seed, as it grows, gains a different reward. They all get saved because there's a yield, but they get, they yield differently. This is, in a way, you could say this is where works would be affected. 
they there's different kingdoms, different things, which is interesting because even um, evangelicals in the late 1700s, actually, there was a common philosophy that lasted for a little bit in the 1700s of having multiple kingdoms in heaven was was not an uncommon thing for evangelicals to believe back then. Uh, so it's not a far fetch to think about that, but we could see again this even an LDS perspective, we can see that within this parable, which is really cool. And now let's jump to the next one, verse 21. And he said unto them, is a candle brought to be put under a bushel or under a bed and not to be set on a candlestick? So this is a fascinating uh, one to think about this idea of if you have a candle, do you take it and then put it under a basket, like put a basket over so you can't see it? Or do you hide it under a bed where you, again, where you can't see it? So think of this as the light of the Spirit, the Holy Ghost with you, okay? Uh, this is really interesting. So do not hide the light of Christ, the Spirit that you have. That's with your testimony. So when you feel the Holy Ghost in your life, do not hide it. Do not hide your testimony. Do not hide those things. Do not be a bushel people where you're hiding your light. Let it shine. Now, here's the thing is, it's not your light that's shining. It's the light of Christ that is shining. You're the candle that is supporting the light, carrying the light, basically. Uh, verse 22, he says, For there is nothing hid which shall not be manifested, neither was anything kept secret, but that it should come abroad. So no, that's the whole point of Armageddon is no secrets, basically. Uh, so again, verse 23, If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. That is another thing that uh, that we see. Now, verse 24, continuing on with this, And he said unto them, Take heed what ye hear, and with what measure ye meet, and it shall be measured to you. And unto you that hear shall more be given. If you think about the idea of the talents, if you take what I'm teaching you and, and start to learn and want to dig deeper and understand it better, then more will be given to you. So that's kind of that, like that idea of the, the talents, parable of the talents. Like Joseph Smith clarifies this a little bit and says, and unto you that continue to receive shall more be given. Uh, now this is, uh, verse 24 is interesting, okay? So let's, Mark does something a little different than what Matthew and Luke does with this. Even verse 25, for he that hath, to him shall be given, and he that hath not, from him shall be taken, even that which he hath. This is something that, this is a concept or principle, okay? You have agency. If you take what Christ is giving you, you take these, you study the scriptures, you seek to have that more relationship with him, then you get more given to you. If you don't, then what has been given will slowly be taken away from you. There's there's a, a principle, a concept here, and the controlling factor is what you do with what you're given. That's the parable of the talents. Uh, so this is an important concept for us to understand as we study more about Christ. The more we study, the more we're going to learn more. The less we study, the less we're going to learn over time and remember about him. Now Mark combines this verse and the next verse. Uh, but Matthew and Luke separate them out between different chapters. So it's interesting that Mark takes verse 24 and 25, puts them right next to each other in his book. But Matthew and Luke separate them out, these two concepts, in different chapters. Uh, in Matthew, this material is divided between Matthew chapter 7, verse 2, and Matthew 13, verse 12. And in Luke, it is divided between Luke 8, 18, and Luke 19, 26. So they split them up, but Mark encapsulates it. And I think this is nice because it helps us to see that principle together, that there is this upward if, if you're moving up, there's going to be a bonus helping you to go faster up. There's If you're moving down, there's going to be a faster, decrease, a faster decline in that as well. So there is an effect, a bonus effect that's going to work with you, but it's going to be the thing. It's based upon how you respond to what you're given. So God is going to give us things, give us knowledge, give us the scriptures, give us opportunity, and we're going to see what we do with it. And that, and then as we do that, there's going to be an acceleration in whatever direction we end up going, basically. So just 
just realize that that's what's what is going to happen basically with this. So really interesting idea that we have. Um, so moving on to verse 26, and he said, so is the kingdom of God as if a man should cast seed into the ground uh, and should sleep and rise night and day and the seed should spring up and grow, he knoweth not how. Now this parable is... So this one's a unique one to the Gospel of Mark. This isn't a parable we find in the other other Gospels, basically. So when we think about planting, okay, so this is a person who's planted seed, and they have, they rise, they're watching their seed, night and day to check it. Is it growing? Is it not? Uh, and the seed might grow and, and take off, but they don't know how it works. They're, you know, it's in the ground. It's, it's almost a, um, a Schrodinger's cat type situation. I plant the seed, I bury it. I don't know if it's alive or dead yet. So I kind of think of it as both. And I'm hoping something is going to tell me, you know, eventually I'm either going to not see it and the, the, the growing season is going to be, be too late and it won't grow or it's going to grow. Uh, so planting occurred in late October and early November, when the early rains had softened the ground after the long, hot summer. Harvest occurred in May or June, followed by threshing and winnowing. That's from Jesus Christ in the world in the New Testament. So realize, when we think of this, we you know, in, in like America, we think of har- sowing seeds around April, May time frame, and then the growing season and then harvest July, August, September. But in the Middle East, it, things don't grow in the summer. It's hot and dry. So you get the rains in fall, you plant, and then the instead of having this cold, bitter winter, you get mild temperatures, which is why winter is a better time to grow than the crazy hot summer. So they grow through the winter and then harvest in spring and then just hunker down for the heat in the summer, basically. So he's growing this, basically. Uh, realize this is a, there's a good principle in this too. Like in verse 27, he says, and he's, he's, he's rising night and day to check on a seat to see what's going on. So understand results take time to measure. Things don't happen necessarily instantaneous all the time. So sometimes things take time. So we have to have some patience with the process. Even as we learn the gospel, it's that remember Alma chapter 32, you think about that with this parable. It's planting a seed and hoping it's going to grow, hoping it's going to turn into something. So uh, you, there's some patience. You have to have some patience with the process. Okay, truth isn't something that just instantaneously comes. There's patience. There's work. There's things you've got to do with this. So it might take some time. When we learn something gospel-wise, it might take some time for us to learn it, to put it into use. So we need to think about that and just remember, oh, this is, I, just because I don't understand it right now, it doesn't mean... It can't be understood, but sometimes I might need this ponder. I need to take some time to think about this and to really understand it better before it'll make total sense. So verse 28, For the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. Talking about, you know, the the seeds will come up, even the seeds that just drop on the ground will come up on their own, and this is the kind of the stages of growth they'll go through. But verse 29, but when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he putteth in the sickle because the harvest has come. So he's, oh yeah, I finally got to the fruit point. So there's lots of stages. I'm growing, I'm growing, I'm getting better. Finally, I get to the point I can harvest this. I can do something with it. So again, sometimes our testimony grows until we get to a point where we can do something with it, where our understanding of the gospel has to grow to a certain point. Then we can do something with it. So sometimes that'll happen. Uh, have patience as you're learning the gospel and, and uh, understanding these things. Now, verse 30, and he said, Whereunto shall we liken the kingdom of God? Or with what comparison shall we compare it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when it is sown in the earth is less than all the seeds that be in the earth. Mustard seed is one of the smallest seeds around, extremely small. Verse 32, but when it is sown, 
it groweth up and becometh greater than all herbs. It shooteth out great branches, so that the fowls of the air may lodge under the shadow of it. So this is, a uh, uh, mustard seed is interesting because it is one of the smallest seeds out there, but it grows into a tree, not an herb. It is treated like an herb. It's mustard, so you grind up the seeds to powder for adding flavor to things just like you would an herb. So we treat the seeds like an herb, but it grows into something much greater than all the other herbs. So it's it's treated like an herb, but it's a tree, actually. So it, that's that comparison. Herbs grow up and are great. They grow flowers, small plants, flowers, you know, two, three feet tall, kind of an idea, whereas mustard seed turns into a great tree. Uh, so it goes from the smallest to the greatest of the herbs. Now, verse 33, and with many parables, such spake he the word unto them as they were able to hear it. So as they could understand it and do more and, and listen and pay attention, he's teaching them. So he's, he's not trying to teach them too much, but help them along as they can. Verse 34, but without a parable spake he not unto them. And when they were alone, he expounded all things to his disciples. So in dealing with the crowds and other people, he's always teaching in parables. And then he goes into some greater detail when he's dealing with his apostles to teach them the greater parts of this. Verse 35, And the same day when the even was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. So now he's going, we need to get to the other side of the sea, so we've gotta, we're going to take this boat we're in and, and go. Verse 36, When they had sent away the multitude, they took, even, took him even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. So there's, in Mark's version, there's more ships. Verse 37, And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. So lots of water coming into this. The Sea of Galilee is really interesting, and we mentioned this in, in Matthew a little bit. It's below sea level, for one thing, and there's lots of high mountains around it. So one thing that happens is as the wind comes in, it rushes down those mountains and across the sea quickly sometimes. And as it does this, it can stir up just a sudden churning of waves really quickly, basically, and get some big waves to happen fast. Uh, so it, it, it can turn into a pretty intense, crazy situation with little warning, basically. Uh, verse 38, and he was in the hinder part of the ship asleep on a pillow, and they wake him. And say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind, and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was great calm. So this is that, again, they're out sailing, trying to get to the other side. Christ has taken a nap. This sudden winds come in, tempest builds up, water coming into the boat. They're freaking out. They're like, oh my gosh, we're about to die. And Jesus is asleep. He doesn't care. So they wake him up you know, do you not care that we're all about to die? And he's like, what are you guys worried about? And he calms the sea down, basically. And then he says here, verse 40, and he said unto them, why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? So he could have meant, why are you afraid after I told you we have work to do? Or something like, have you forgot that I am with you? So he's, he's, he's kind of like, guys, do you not understand I can control this. You know, it would have been better if you just go, hey, Jesus, wake up. We need your help. We need you to help with this. We we believe in you and you can control the elements. And so can you help us with this? That's not what they said. So they're showing that there's a lack of, there's still a lack of faith in his, his apostles at this point. They're not quite there yet. Verse 41, and they feared exceedingly, said no one to another, what manner of man is this, even that the wind and sea obey him. So again, they're still surprised. We've seen him heal people, which is great, but now he can control the elements? Holy cow, this is amazing. So they're still not quite there yet in their belief in him, basically. So let's continue this story in the next chapter, and we will see you then.